Hi, Gordon Atkinson here. It is um, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter, and last week I did this little thing where I talked uh, kind of to you out there, people who um, come by Real Life Preacher, and, and it was really enjoyable for me, and so anyway, I'm back again. You probably noticed that I do a lot of doodling, and that, that is, I actually have sheets and sheets of paper and and pencils and things, and I, you know, I, I, I just do doodle a whole lot while I'm thinking and, and doing sermon and stuff and just basically throw the papers away so you know this is this is actually the sheet that I've been working my you know notes for the sermon on so you know what I actually I've I've kind of got my Matthew Mark Luke and John so I've done a comparison for myself the various you know accounts of the resurrection because it is Easter so uh yeah Easter is sort of our big um holiday you know the big one Christmas and Easter are both pretty big the, the C and E crowd, ministers call them. A lot of people come out to church, you know, who have never been at church before. So many churches experience this big swell of attendance. We don't really have that so much at Covenant because we're 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 kind of out of the way, you know. We're sort of out here in the woods, and and so uh, you know, people don't. This is not the church that people are gonna are gonna go to if uh, if someone says, "Don't you think we should go to a church?" I mean, it is Easter and. You know, maybe it's a woman who says that, and she's like, come on, Frank, you know, think of the kids. And You know, this is not really the church that they're going to come to because we because they probably only know it's here. So our attendance will, you know, generally be about the same as it ever is. Uh, and then that's fine. So this year we're doing Mark, Mark's Gospel. Um, I have an option of doing Mark or John. I'm definitely doing, doing Mark because I have to just be honest, John's Gospel really hard for me you know I'm one of those sort of skeptical people who I mean I really have to work hard at believing stuff that's I'm going to talk a little bit about that later and John just really <laughs> pushes all my buttons I find John to be hard for me to believe so anyway Mark Mark I love very simple the, the simplest gospel so let me look let me just go ahead and read it to you I mean you know this is the text this is what we're all going to be reading and, uh, you know, how many thousands of times have I heard this? I grew up as a minister's son, you know, a little Baptist boy, going to Sunday school all of my life, you know. So for someone like me, can you imagine how many times I've read this story? Thousands and thousands of times. You read it so many times that like it starts out as like a story in your childhood, and then it's sort of the story that you learn theologically, and then it's the story that you first doubted, and then... You decided uh, you were afraid to admit your doubt, and then it was the story you decided you didn't believe in at all, and then it was the story that kind of broke your heart and you wished it was true, and then it was the story that you appreciated its literary value, and then it was the story that, after you learned the original language of it, was even more stunning, and and then it was the story you mused on, and then it was the story that you, you returned to during your conservative 20s, and then it was the story that you, you know confess in your 30s that, you know, yes, even after all these years, you have a hard time believing. I mean, for someone like me, this thing is just such a part of my life, it's hard to even separate it out. So here it is, the story of the resurrection, our text for Sunday. And I'm going to be able to talk to you about things that I will not be able to say on Sunday morning, which is why this is very therapeutic for me. Again, I'm watching the clock, so we're doing okay. Okay, the resurrection of Jesus, Mark 16, verses 1 to 8. And I'm that's Mark ends at 8 as far as I'm concerned. There's some longer endings to Mark, but they're not very credible. So just we're going to read the original. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. No one knows who Salome is, by the way. Um, there's some guesses, but don't. just one of the women that were there. Very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for, for us from the entrance to the tomb? And that's a fair question. And uh, I may start and stop a little bit. For a, I, I used to wonder that, well, why in the heck were they even going to the tomb? You know, I mean, they, they knew he was there. I kind of finally decided that the women in, in, the, in all the stories of the resurrection, all four of them, the women are just there. Okay? They're just there. You... You can't drive them away. You can't frighten them away. 
you know, everyone else runs away, and there's, you know, the women st standing by. They're watching the crucifixion, this grisly thing. I mean, they're just not going to leave him. And I have to think that there, there are times when you just say things like, look, they put him in the ground, and we didn't get to do the burial ritual stuff, but he was our friend, and we, we adored him, and his life deserves more than that. So by God, I'm going to the tomb with the spices. And if I have to walk all the way there and just stop at the stone and just sprinkle the spices around, I want to be able to say that I did everything. I don't want to say, you know, no, well, we didn't show up at the tomb to do the spices. Obviously, there was a stone there. This is just, you know, the women in this story, are their faithfulness is really rather stunning. So they're going. and they're Whatever else happens, they're going. So uh, when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from, fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement seized them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Uh, only gospel account where they say nothing to anyone, but I think clearly uh, that's just that, that's just kind of like I mean right around the event. You know, they didn't say anything as they ran away. They didn't stop and talk to people. They went all the way back. Clearly, they they did tell people because the story got out. Matthew and Luke and John, you know, kind of expand the story a bit. Um, also, side note, I think whenever you do Mark, uh, there's some really cool idea with the with this Peter thing. I mean uh, the the man says, tell my disciples and Peter, as if Peter's not a part of the disciples. And I once did an Easter sermon that was kind of based on that, where I, I said, you know, if they just said the disciples, Peter wouldn't know if he was still included after he had denied Jesus. And and so this was the moment of grace. You know, tell the disciples, and yes, you, Peter, you know, you're still in the club. Uh, so that's, that's an angle I've taken before with Mark. But it's seven minutes, and I really haven't talked to you yet about the thing I need to talk to you about. So here we go. I mean, let, let's let's face it. This is this is rather hard to believe. I don't remember when it was the first time that I sort of sat up and went, you know, this is a bizarre story. Man dies and gets buried, and everybody's saying he came back from the dead. That's crazy talk. And you know, being in the church, especially as a young boy, you know, young man, you know, you look around and you're just like, it's like the emperor has no clothes. You're just like, am I the only person who sees this? You know, I used to see people. Uh, you know, like Baptists who would be like snickering at Mormon theology. Like it's so weird, you know. And I'm going, T dude, have you heard what we're saying? You know, it doesn't get much weirder than that. And uh, so, you know, for many years, I always struggled with this because I've always struggled to believe. I mean, the, you know, year, year after year, if you put a polygraph on me, you know, and my daughter was over there and, you know, some, some guy said he had a gun to my head. Well, he wouldn't need a gun to my head. I'm on a polygraph. And he said, okay, man, if you, uh, if you lie and those needles go like that, I'm going to kill your daughter. Do you believe that historically there was a day when Jesus, the man, came back from the dead? If the life of my daughter, um, you know, if it, uh, was, it was on the line, I, I would have to say, no, probably don't, you know. Now, that immediately puts me into a really bad place. Just, I mean, people are just shocked. You know, oh, my God, he's denying the resurrection. It's, I'm not. You just kind of have to hang with me a little bit. Because, you know, as a preacher, as a minister, here I am in the Christian community, and, you know, maybe I have those doubts, but it's not really my job to talk about those on Sunday morning. My job is to, you know, make clear the text, and that's what I always try to do. So, um you know, so you know, so for year after year, you know, I basically just proclaim along with everybody else, you know, the central, central part of our story. Someone once suggested that they thought my depression came because so many times I had, uh, you know, in, in being faithful to my community, I had you know proclaimed things which sort of cut against some instinctive part of me, and. Uh, Whenever someone said that to me, I was just didn't want to listen to it. Like I don't want to think that that makes me depressed. So don't please don't say that to me. Um. So this has been a hard Sunday for me some years, and you know, but though some I don't know five or six or eight years ago, 
I came upon something which has been very comforting to me and has kind of helped me stay with this story and sort of re actually reintroduced me to maybe even a new kind of belief. I don't say that you should think this, and I don't know whether it's orthodox or not orthodox or anything, but um, this is kind of how I've made my peace with the story and, 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 and with you know the idea of faith. Oh, last week someone wanted to know what I was doodling, so just... I know how to draw little goofy buildings and uh, little round like cylinder things, and I love shading, and that's pretty much I just draw stuff and shade it. So I got to thinking once a few years ago that, you know, my belief is pretty precious to me. For me to give assent to something is a big deal. Like if I say I believe something, that's a really big deal to me. If I believe you, that's a big deal. If I believe something happened, that's a big deal. I'm not the sort of person you know, who takes belief lightly. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting over there, I'm drinking a Diet Coke while I was working, I was typing, and I swear the Diet Coke just went like this. Completely on its own, you know. Uh, I'm looking over like, what? Well, I'm not the sort of person who would just go, hey, a ghost, you know. I looked at the Diet Coke, and I was like, okay, there's clearly going to be a scientific explanation. And, and there was, condensation had and combined with this little concave bottom of, and a sl sort of sl slight slope of my desk over there, and it just kind of hydroplane a bit. And uh, that's who I am. You know, so for me to say I believe something is a big deal. You know, I mean, it really is a big deal. Very precious. And there's a lot of shame wrapped up in it, too, because I don't want to be seen as a stupid person. And that's a pride issue that I have. I want to be smart. I think I am kind of smart. I'm a guy that is intelligent, and and I've been I've spent time in my life being smug about that and proud. I'm extremely ashamed of that because, you know, if you are intelligent, that's no better than being tall, you know. But yeah, there's sort of pride there. So um, you know, if I say I believe in the resurrection, you know, what are what are people going to think of me outside of the church? You know, what a dummy. So I got to thinking. So what is it that I could give? The creator of all the universe as a kind. Of, if I have, if I was going to give some kind of a thank you just for my life and being there, you know, it's for me. It is my participation in a in a community that's based on thanksgiving and praise and and seeking to to live our lives of gratitude and grace. And this is our central story. So this is the thing that I have to believe. And I just realized that. So I kind of just looked at this with God. I was like, okay, I'm going to believe this. I'm just letting you know, though, this is like all I've got. You know, I can't believe a whole lot more than this. This is pretty much so I'm carrying around the resurrection story, and people say, so do you believe the resurrection? I say, yeah, I do. I really do believe it. And they're like, really, really believe it? I say, yeah, I just kind of decided to a few years back. I, it's like the most extravagant gift I could give to the creator of the universe. You know, I'm going to get some serious bad email from people who are going to say, you know, God, you idiot. You know, you're basically have just told us that, you know, your belief is some kind of insane gift to a creator you don't know, and so you're going to believe goofy stuff. Is that true? I guess it is. I guess it is, because I do. I decided to believe it. I did tell God, though, so don't ask me to believe a whole lot else. I'm going to have a really hard time. So that, but that allows me on, on uh, for the last few years though on, on Easter morning to be you know kind of filled with joy and to join uh, the rest of the people and say this I believe this is our central story and it tells uh, what Christianity is supposed to tell and it tells it in lang a language that makes sense to everybody so Easter's coming uh, that will not be my sermon but I will be here on Sunday morning and I will I will be proclaiming with the rest of the community. That Christ is risen. And uh, some part of me will just look up and go, and you know, I've given you the best I've got. And I give you that. You know, that's the best I've got. So. Oh my gosh, 14 minutes. Um, honestly, I probably won't put this online. It's too long. It feels very indulgent. Well, maybe I will. I don't know.